already. So Dr. Anabandi, he will be lecturing Mondays 12.30 and Wednesdays 10.30. All of this information is on ClickUp. If you have questions, you're welcome to ask. So you're listening to the voice of Dr. Wiggins. That's my email address. So my two lessons per week will be online at the moment, Mondays 10.30, Thursdays 8.30. And I'm the course coordinator. And then Mr. Priya is our module administrator. Uh, tutorials are 1.5 hours long. Um, Lazuku, see the announcement. So we went through the trouble of printing hard copies of the course notes and bring the course notes to tutorials. So tutorials will be 1.5 hours long. It will be on campus. It will be compulsory. So. Kaylin, yes. So at the moment, the answer is yes. So for 218, you can even come and collect your course notes next week. Kaylin, you're welcome. Kaylin, you're welcome. This is why I like having live lessons so that I can answer your questions if you come early to the lesson or if you stick around after the lesson then you can also ask questions. So please read the study guide. Please read the course notes. Um, see announcements. When and where you can collect notes. And remember, you've got to be doing maths every day. And also join the Discord server. All right. Um, Shongwe, what is the question? Shongwe, what is the question? Tats? Um, we will supply that information later this week. So that info is, is coming soon. So that info is coming soon. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yes, that's a typo. That's a typo. That is indeed 11.30. That's indeed 11.30. <laughs> that's indeed 11.30. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. It's 11.30. <laughs> it's, it's good to see you guys are awake, you guys are fresh, and you guys are ready for the semester ahead. So, as always, I will, at the end of my lesson, turn my notes into a PDF, and I will share it. And I will also be recording my lessons. So, my lessons will be recorded. So, this is WTW218. Short title is multivariable calculus. Are there more questions I can handle right now? I like questions. Questions are good. If you have questions, it's good. Otherwise, I hope you have pen and paper and you're ready to do maths with me. So we are moving at quite a pace. We are finishing chapter one this week in live lessons. So that means next week's tutorial will be on chapter one work. So next week's tutorial will be on chapter one work. So it is important that you do maths every day. This includes doing maths over weekends. This includes doing maths over weekends. Mr. Latabo, you have a question. You're welcome to go to the chat box and type your question. Mr. Latabo, you just go to the chat box and you should be able to type your question. So classes are starting at 11.30. So in four minutes time, we're going to get rock and rolling our very first lesson of 218. Um, so if you go to my tab, Dr. Wiggins notes, if you go to my tab, Dr. Wiggins notes, I have added a YouTube link and Clarica, this is the one that I'm referring to. Oh, 
Okay, you don't have any questions. Good, good, good. As I said, so the question that I'm referring to is this link that I shared via my tab. Clarica, can I get a smiley face that you're happy with that? That is the, okay, good. <laughs> so please, um, we help one another. This is why I try to come early to lessons and I stay a little bit longer to answer some of your questions. Alrighty. So, oh, it is so good to, I've met some of you guys this morning collecting course notes. And it's so good to see you guys again. And I hope to see you guys in tutorials next week. And as always, I will try to start each lesson with a warm up problem. So just a quick check. Did you understand the previous lesson? Or maybe I am plotting a seat for the lesson that I'm going to give. So 218 is a beautiful course and we are building on top of 124. So you're not allowed to forget any first year mathematics. That is why in assignment one, there are problems we have to use integration by parts. There are problems we have to use partial fractions. And there's also problems where you have to use strict substitution and also limits. You are not allowed to forget any high school maths. You're not allowed to forget any of the maths that you've learned in first year, because we are now in 218 going to need some of those mathematics. So if you notice there's something that you've forgotten, like you don't know how to draw the arc sine function, revise it today. The sooner, the better. The sooner, the better. Alrighty. So seven people have watched the video. Thank you. Those of you that haven't watched the video, if you can, please watch it later today. Alrighty. So those of you that just joined, I am Dr. Wiggins. You're listening to me and my live lessons are currently scheduled for Monday at 1130 and Thursdays at 830. Alrighty. So um, I want to scroll a little bit down. So in a few seconds, we're going to start. I hope you have pen and paper. You cannot do mathematics without pen and paper. All right. So please always have lots of paper, lots of pens with you. Alrighty. So just to give you a slight overview. Welcome, everybody. We are starting now. So what is 218 about? Now, in first year, we talked about single variable calculus. So functions of one variables, we played with them. And some of the ways we played with functions, we drew them. We played with limits. We played with continuity. Then we looked at differentiability. And then we learned some integration techniques. And now in this course, what we want to do is we want to play with functions of more than one variable. And then obviously we want to ask the big question. How do we do limits with these kind of functions? How does continuity work? Differentiability, how does it work? It actually turns out that differentiability becomes very interesting. You start getting things like directional derivatives, differentiability, and when it comes to integration, you will actually learn some new ways of integration techniques. So life gets quite fun when you start to take functions of one variable, start playing with functions of more than one variable, and trying to carry over these ideas. And this is, in a nutshell, what the course is about. But please, if you can, watch this video it's a little bit longer and it will give you a little bit more insight in what do i mean by extending the ideas from first year maths to second year mathematics Alrighty, so let's get going with chapter 1.1 so the a good question that you can ask is why do we need functions of more than one variable well 
A short answer is life is complicated. And uh, another answer is, for example, if you look at the final mark for the course, it will depend on many factors. Maybe the amount of sleep you get every day, the amount of maths you do every day. Are you doing the exercises in the book? Are you doing physical exercises? Are you doing the lecture videos? Are you doing the exercises in the notes? Are you preparing for tutorials? Are you understanding the work? So the final mark for your 218 course will depend on many factors. So that will mean that it's a function with many inputs and one output, which is your final mark. And you can come up with many, many more reasons. Can I get a smiley face that you guys are okay with this idea that life is complicated? And, and I'm sure you've seen this in other courses that you're going to need functions of more than one variable. Maybe in economics, if you want to know the price of an item, supply and demand. So two inputs and the output would be the price of the item. So there are a gazillion reasons why you're going to need functions of more than one variable. So the list is endless. The list is endless. So there's a really, really, really important that we start studying those kind of functions. Now, before we start studying those functions, we are going to need n dimensional vector space. So Rn, so definition, so DEF, this is the set of all n-dimensional vectors. So we're using the notation of one to four. So it's a vector with n components, x1 all the way up until xn, where each component is a real number. So each component is a real number. So typically, real numbers is just a real number. R squared is all the 2D vectors. R cubed is all the 3D vectors, etc. So Let's now have a definition. A function of n variables is a function f from rn to r. So a function of one variable was from r to r. A function of two variables is from r squared to r. And a function of three variables is from r cubed to r. So here's an example in blue. So f is a function from r cubed to r. So for every 3D vector, x, y, z, the output is x plus y squared plus z cubed. So a function of n variables have n inputs and one output. Is there any questions? I hope this makes sense. So we're going to need r to the n. So n-dimensional vector is a vector with n components. So a function of n variables is defined as a function from r to the n or a subset of that to r. If you've just joined, we are now, before we can do multivariable calculus, we got to talk about multivariable functions. And a multivariable function is a function of n variables. So typically it's a function of r to the n to r or a subset of r to the n to r. All right, so here is an example. So if input x, y, z and output x plus y squared plus z cubed. So that is an example of a function of three variables, but you will make, you can make your own examples and you will see examples in the course notes. Now we also have to start talking about domain. So the domain of a function is the set of acceptable inputs. So if f is a function of n variables, the domain of f are all those n-dimensional vectors for which the function is defined. Can I get a smiley face that you see that this is similar how we define domain in first year. So the domain of an n, a function of n variables is all the allowed inputs. But now you've got to be careful. You've got to know that it is a function of n variables. So the domain is all the acceptable inputs. And then the range, no surprise, is the set of all possible outcomes. So the range of f is you take all of the n-dimensional vectors that's sitting in the domain, you plug into the function, and you collect all of them together, and you form a set. So, so far, we've defined what it means to be a function of n variables, the concept of domain, and the concept of range.
It's very important that you're comfortable with these ideas. So we're taking our ideas from functions of one variable, and now we're extending it to functions of more than one variable. And this is a running theme throughout this course. And sometimes surprises comes our way, and that makes maths and, and life quite interesting. All right, so do take note of that. All right, so this is a remark. So here, if it's a function of three variables, so it's from R cubed to R. So X is a three dimensional vector. So it has components, so X line, so X bar. So that's a 3D vector with components X, Y, Z. It's in the domain. Then the value of F at vector X is defined by F input X, Y, Z or F X bar. So that is just notation. And remember notation matters in 218. Notation matters in 218. So if f is a function of three variables, depending if you know the input is vector x bar or you know the 3D vector, there are two ways of notating the value of f at vector x. Please read your textbook every day. Um, there's a comment on the top of page three that I would like you to read. And you could do something similar for a function of two variables. So if vector v, is a vector with components x, y, so it's an element of R2, then the value of the function at vector v can be notated as on the left, as on the right. So notation matters. There's time for a quick question before we start doing some really fun stuff. All right. Remember, I do stay after the lesson if there is something that you would like to have clarification upon. Alrighty, so let's see what kind of questions you can expect in semester test one. Here is a function from R cubed to R, where the function is defined by this formula. If we want to know the domain and the range. All right, um, Jaden, so multivariable, so multi, is from R to the N to R. And a vector is a vector function is from R to R to the N. Um, no, you cannot use differentiability. At Lusuku, no. All right. So the difference comes into the domain and range. That is an excellent question. And, and you can clearly see a multivariable function is from R to the N to R, and a vector function is from R to R to the N. So do not get the two confused, all right? So this is the details that you've got to make sure that you are happy. All righty, so let's have a look at this function. So this is a function of two variables. I'm sure I don't have to convince you guys. This is a function of two variables. So if I write down the domain, I want to know all the acceptable 2D vectors such that, now looking at this formula, where do you think the troubles will come from? Looking at this formula, where do you guys think the troubles will come from? Anybody? Yes, the square root sign. Remember the square root sign. So we want all the 2D vectors x, y such that, x squared minus y is greater or equal to zero. So this is the answer in set notation. So this will be all the 2D vectors. And we can write this a little bit nicer. We can say when x squared is greater or equal to y. Now for fun, let's draw it. For fun, let's draw it. So that's the x axis, that's the y axis. So we want all the 2D vectors, x, y, where x squared is greater or equal to y squared. So I'm going to draw the parabola. This is the parabola y equal to x squared. But now I want to know from you guys, is it the, so we have the domain in set notation and make sure you know set notation well. So if you draw it, is it the points below the parabola or above? Let's quickly vote on this one. So the domain, is all the 2D vectors x, y such that whatever we plug into the square root sign is zero or positive. And now 
maybe take an, an example of a point. See if the point for one or one four. So see which point, because this is a good question. This is a very good question for the semester test. So you need to find all the acceptable 2D vectors that you can plug into this formula. And it seems pretty close. All right, guys, it seems very close. At the moment, it's, it's basically 50-50. All right, if you're in doubt, take an example like this. For one, it is sitting in the domain. Why? Because when I evaluate f at 4, 1, that's going to be the square root of 4 squared minus 1 plus 1. That's the square root of 15 plus 1, so it exists. So I know that 4, 1 is, and I hope that, that some of you guys, maybe you can change your answer. So if I plug the 2D vector 4, 1 into the function, I can see I do get an output. So 4, 1 is in the domain. And so this will be the point 4, 16. This will be the point 4, 1. And so the correct answer to this question is, if you have to draw it, is this. Yaku, do you have a question? So this is the domain. It's a function of two variables. So it's all the 2D vectors such that x squared is greater than equal to y. All right. Um, so you want to have all the points where the y value is below the parabola. Jaden, so that's another way of explaining it. So if you draw the parabola y is equal to x squared, then it will be all the points where x squared is equal to y squared. But you want the y values to be less than that. So it has to be below. All right. So I'm going to leave it for you. Hashtag figure it out today. All right. This is the answer. All right. And the range. Well, looking at this function, what is the smallest value that this function can be? What is the smallest value that this function can be? Can anybody tell me in the output, in the chat? So that is the domain. Yep. So the square root is at least zero. So this is greater or equal to zero plus one plus one. So the answer. So we see that the smallest that the function can be is one. So we think that the range will be this interval. And how do we show that this is the range? By showing for every possible output, there's an input with that output. Let me repeat what I mean by that. So this is the answer that we want for assignment one. So take t greater or equal to one. And what I want is an input so the input must be a 2D vector whose output is going to be T. So take a real number greater or equal to one, and I want an input whose output is going to be T. So to make my life easy, I'm going to make Y zero. And fiddling a little bit with it, you will see, try the following. Try the square root of T minus one. And I'm going to leave it for you to verify that this works. So if you take t greater or equal to 1, plugging in this 2D vector, so if t is greater or equal to 1, the root of t minus 1 exists. So we form this 2D vector. And if I plug this 2D vector into f, it becomes t. If verify this, this is quite tricky. Again, this is a nice question we can ask. So looking at the function, the function is greater or equal to 1. So we think the range is this interval. So now to prove it, we've got to show that for every t greater or equal to 1, there's an input whose output will be t. And this is an input that works. All righty. It's quite tricky. That is why you got to redo these class examples. And if you are lost, um, ask on Discord. Ask on Discord for more details. Or if you have a maths buddy, ask. Otherwise, you've got to figure it out. You've got to figure it out. You are smart. You have all passed one to four. So you are smart. 
you can figure it out. Let's quickly do another quick example. So let's take the function from r squared to r given by the formula. If input x, y, so this 2D vector, the output is arc sine 2x plus y. We want to determine the domain and range. Maybe draw it if you're bored. So let's do the domain. So because f is a function of two variables, we want to know the acceptable inputs for arc sine. Who knows the acceptable inputs for arc sine? Remember Marco? Marco, remember the x value gets squared. The x value gets squared. Let me just see. Oh, wait, wait, wait. There, that's that's got to be, yes, t minus 1. Thank you, Marco. Yeah, you're quite right. Yes, it's t minus 1. Because t minus 1 squared becomes t minus 1 squared. You take the square root. Yeah, thank you for that, Marco. I was being naughty putting. <laughs> yes. Guys, you are... You are impressing me. You are impressing me. I am so happy. So this bracket, this bracket, 2x plus y, this bracket, 2x plus y, that must be between minus 1 and 1. Remember I told you, you're not allowed to forget any first year mathematics. And you can now rewrite that as saying y has got to be 1 minus 2x and minus 1 minus 2x. Lusuku, you've got to be careful with your symbol. Arc sine 1 does exist, and arc sine minus 1 does exist. Can I get a smiley face, Lusuku? Lusuku, can I get a smiley face? So the input, 2x plus y, should be between 1 and minus 1. You can rewrite it, you get this. And so now, this is great, because you can draw this straight line and this straight line, and the domain will be sitting between those two straight lines. So for fun, draw it and take note the domain is a subset of r2 so it's all the 2d vectors all right now who knows the range of the arc sine function so from first year maths what is the range for an arc sine function so arc sine whatever has an output in which interval i know i'm digging deep but remember guys you got to remember all your maths from year one this is the kind of question. Nope. I need an interval. Yes, there we go. No, it's not. Huh? Nope. Guys, so if x is 0, then we get f naught y. So twice naught plus y is arc sine y, and that's going to be from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. So nb, check your note. And look at the graph of y equal to arc sine x. So well done to Rob, Ms. Dube, Ntsibi, and Moses. You guys are spot on the money. So if x is naught, then this function becomes naught y, which is arc sine y, and we know that that is what the output will be on this interval and so let's continue so just like the previous problem this is what we think the range will be so what we now have to do is the following so now we gotta take any t in this interval and our job is to come up with an input that if we plug it into the function, so this will be a 2D vector whose output will be t. Because if we can do this, then we know what the range is. And a lot of the time, it's quite fun doing these things. And what I would do is I would try the following. So it's sometimes a little bit of a guessing game, but let's try this. Can I get a smiley face that you see the input is a 2D vector? This is the 2D vector, component 0 sine t. Yeah? And so what is the function that we're dealing with? The function that we're dealing is twice the first component. Ah, sorry, let me write that down. So the function is arc sine, the twice the first component plus y. So it becomes this. 
And so this becomes arc sine sine t, where t is an interval from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. And what is the answer to this expression? What is arc sine of sine t if t is on this interval? Yebo. So now we have shown for anything in this interval, we can find an input whose output is t. So thus, the range of this function is from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. All right. So please redo these two examples. Not only should you know what a function of two or three or many variables is, but you should also be able to manipulate now domains and ranges with these kind of functions. All right. Joshua, that's not necessary. So, so what I've done here is we know that the range is a subset of that and every value on that interval is achievable. So therefore the range is that. Joshua, do you see this is this is sufficient? All right, just double check the logic, Joshua. If sure, ask on Discord. Yes. Remember, you need to come up with a convincing argument. Right? Now, what do you guys think is another good question to ask? So if you have a function of two variables, what is another good thing that you would like to be able to do with those functions? Any takers? Maybe those of you that read the textbook. Yes, Lizuku. Yes, we are visual creatures. We are visual creatures. So we would like to see what these things look like. All right. Um, because we want to show that every output in that range is possible, Marco. Marco, is that answering your question? So. We can't get an output whose answer is a million, but we can get an input whose output is pi over two. We can get an input whose output is 0 0.75 with this formula marker. Do you see it? So we want to show that for every possibility in this interval, we can find an input whose output is there. Well, okay, this is deep stuff. This is deep stuff, everybody. This is why you, if, you, if, if you haven't started doing maths, now you've got to be doing maths every day, all right? Because we are like the how train. We are just steaming forward. We are steaming forward. All right, now, this is already chapter 1.2 in the course notes, and this is very important for chapter five and six. Please pay super attention. This is so important for chapter five and six. So a good question you can ask is how do we draw the graphs of functions of two variables? So we're going to focus on functions of two variables. All right. Now, obviously, we're going to need three axes. So we use the last three letters of the English alphabet, X, Y, Z. So if you have a function whose input one, two becomes an output of five, this is what you would do. You would go travel one unit in the x direction, two units in the y direction, and z is typically upwards, so five upwards, and we get the green dot. Can I get a smiley face? This is how you would sketch a function whose input, the 2D vector becomes the output five. All right, but obviously you won't just do it for one point. You will do it for all of the points in the domain. So here is the formal definition. Here is the formal definition. It's quite a mouthful, but you guys are smart. So let's go for it. Let f be a function of two variables. So this is only for functions of two variables with domain df, which is a subset of R2. Remember, because it's a function of two variables, it's a set of 2D vectors. So it's a subset of R2. So the df is all the 2D vectors you can plug into f. The graph, and I've underlined the word graph. So the graph of F is the set of 3D vectors. So the graph of F is all the 3D vectors. Let's use the form X, Y, Z, such that 
the 2D vector XY is in the domain of F, and the third component, which we label Z, Z is F evaluated at the 2D vector XY. Are there any questions on this definition? This is a very important definition. So F is a function of two variables. The graph of F is a set of all possible 3D vectors, X, Y, Z, such that X, Y is in the domain of F. So you can plug that 2D vector into F. And the third component is the value of F evaluated at X, Y. Give me a, a thumbs up or a smiley face if you're happy with this definition. So this is what we mean by the graph of a function of two variables. Very important. Sometimes it's good to rewrite a definition. It's good to talk about the definition so that it makes sense. Again, I want to emphasize this is very important for chapter five and six. This is very important for chapter five and six. You need to understand what we mean by a function of two variables, sometimes knowing its domain and range, and now knowing what the graph looks like. Alrighty. So, a remark. So, REM is a remark. Can we also have a relationship between X and Y in that case? No. No, 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 no. <laughs> so, here, X and Y is independent. So, the short answer is not now. All right. So, the graph of, of a function of two variables can be visualized as a surface in 3D because of the definition. So we often refer to the graph of f as a surface with equation z is equal to fxy. So what we do is for all possible inputs, x, y, and they could be unrelated, it doesn't matter, we calculate the output and we form the 3D vector x, y, z, or the z is f evaluated at that 2D vector. So if we start plotting all of those points, we get a collection of points which we are going to use the terminology surface. All right, so we're going to use the te terminology surface. So this is quite beautiful. So if you have an, an equation, z is fxy, when we sketch it using this manner, we get a beautiful three-dimensional object which we call surface. Are there any more questions? And surfaces? you got to understand very well. It's an introductory lesson, but so please go home, redo these examples, and make sure that you are comfortable with the words and the terminology. All right, we have happiness. So let's quickly talk about this. All right, so we want to be able to draw this and we need a plan to draw this all right so obviously you can play and plot a lot of points but you want to be a little bit more strategic so we haven't developed the machinery of calculus and that's coming in chapter three so soon but for now we want to be able to draw this surface without calculus so what we're going to do is we are going to take the surface and we're going to slice it with planes so we're going to see where does the surface cut the xy plane, the yz plane, the zx plane. So that's four calculations. And then what we're going to do is we're going to see if we slice the surface with z equal to k. So z representing the height. So if we ask this question in tutorials or in the exam, you've got to do the following calculations. you got to, it's like bread. Bread, you take a knife and you slice it along a plane. So you're going to take the surface and you're going to slice it along the following four planes. X equal to naught, Y equal to naught, Z equal to naught, and Z equal to K. Are there any questions? So in 218, if we ask you to sketch a surface, you got to cut the surface with the following four planes, z equal to naught, x equal to naught, y equal to naught, and z equal to k. Each one could be one or two marks. So you got to do them all. So 
instead of figuring out what it looks like, we are going to investigate by doing CAT scans. So, Clarica, maybe with this example, you can re-ask your question afterwards, all right? So, I've chosen this following example. So, here I have a function of two variables. I have a function of two variables. So, with this input, the output is 2x squared plus y squared minus 4. And we got to do those four calculations. So, the first calculation is, we want to find the intersection with the xy plane. So the graph of f, which is a bunch of 3D points, that's the intersect symbol with a plane z equal to zero. And we want to work this out. All right, so this is the first calculation. So we want to see if we sketch the surface, where does it cut the xy plane? So where does it cut the xy plane? So we have z is equal to 2x squared plus y squared minus 4. So if z is zero, so this becomes zero. Rearranging it, it becomes 2x squared plus y squared equal to 4. I'm going to divide by 4. Who can tell me what is this famous shape? Who can tell me what is this famous shape? You know this. Yes. Remember, I told you, you've got to remember everything from first year mathematics. This is a famous shape. It's an ellipse. So we can sketch this ellipse quite easily. Label your axis appropriately. So we're doing the xy plane. So that's the x axis and that's the y axis. Um, and that's the y axis. Where does it cut the y axis? Who can tell me where does it cut the y axis? Maybe add the word ellipse. If you're not good at drawing things, just add the word ellipse. Yep, it's easy to see. It cuts it at 2 minus 2 and it cuts the x-axis at root 2 and minus root 2. There we go. And if you want to, you can even answer this question. So the graph of f is all the 3D vectors intersecting it with a plane when z is equal to 0. So that's going to be all the 2D vectors x, y, 0 such that 4 is equal to 2x squared plus y squared. So remember, we are taking the surface and we are slicing it with an xy plane and the output will be an ellipse. Are there any questions? So we have an unknown surface which we're trying to figure out without calculus. So we are slicing this unknown surface with a plane z equal to zero. And the output in that case is an ellipse. And it's very easy to see where the ellipse cuts the x-axis and the y-axis. I hope you have pen and paper and you are doing the calculation with me. All right. I don't hear any questions. So let's do this calculation again. But now let's do a different slice. Now we want to slice it with the xz plane. So what variable is missing? What variable is missing when you do x, z? Yep, y is missing. So in this equation, you put y equal to 0. So we have z is equal to 2x squared minus 4. And who can identify what is this shape? So remember now we've got to draw this in the x axis, z axis. You've got to label your axes. Guys, you're making my heart warm and fuzzy. You're making my heart warm and fuzzy. Yes, it's a, it's a parabola. It's a parabola. Can I get a smiley face that you guys see? I've labeled my axis, the x-axis and the z-axis. I've emphasized this last year. Now it's going to be even more important. Can I get more smiley faces? This is now the x-axis and the z-axis because we are sketching z equal to 2x squared minus 4 on the x-axis and the z-axis. It's a parabola. And what do I indicate? What, what features of the parabola do I indi indicate, ladies and gentlemen? I, I would skip turning points. I would skip turning points. I would typically indicate um, where it cuts the z-axis. That's minus 4. And it cuts the x-axis at 2 and at minus 2. 
How cool is this? Depending on how we slice our surface, if we slice it in the one plane, it was an ellipse. And now if we slice it this way, it becomes a parabola. All right. And uh, you know yourself, if you take an object, any 3D object, and if you slice it with different planes, this, the dissection piece that you get will sometimes look differently. All right. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Somehow my device removed my root two part. There we go. Gold star to Vusi Musi. Vusi Musi, I'm so glad to have you here. I've missed you, Vusi Musi. I really, really missed you. All right. I hope we have happiness that you guys agree. So this is the answer. It's a parabola. We know where it cuts the x-axis, so we know where it cuts the z-axis. All right. Let's do another one. So x equal to zero. So let me just quickly rewrite it. So now it will become z equal to y squared minus four. And what is the shape this time around? If we sketch it in the y axis and the z axis, what shape is it this time around? Yep, it's again a parabola. It's again a parabola. So if you like me, you're not really good at drawing things, just add the word parabola. And please indicate when y is zero, it cuts the z axis at minus four. And when z is zero, it cuts the y axis at two and minus two. There you go. All right. But three slices ain't enough. Three slices ain't enough. To get an idea of what the surface look like. So if you go to the doctor and they do a brain scan, they're not just going to take three images. They're going to take a lot of images. All right. So if you have a funny looking bread and you're only making three slices, you have too little data. We want to have a lot of data. All right. And so the way to get a lot of data is to do the following slice. Yes, Rob. All right. So instead of just doing Z equal to one, Rob, let's go ambitious, Rob. Rob, what about this plan if we go Z equal to K? Rob, can I get a smiley face? This is actually cooler because now we can do one, five, a million, a billion. All right. So let's be ambitious. So Z equal to 2X squared plus Y squared minus 4. Now let's take the graph and intersect it with a plane Z equal to K. So we want to find all those points of height K. So We've already done all the points of height zero. Now we want to find the points of height K. All right. So we're going to do Z equal to K. So it becomes K is that. For obvious reasons, we're going to rewrite this because looking at the right-hand side, who can make an observation of the right-hand side? So writing it like this. Anybody? Why did I write it like this? Look at the right hand side. Z equal to K is just easier because K is a fixed number, Clarica. Clarica, K could be one. K could be five. All right. Um, guys, looking at 2x squared plus y squared, yeah, we're not going to do cases. We're not going to do cases. Anybody? All right. <laughs> what I'm looking for is the following, ladies and gentlemen. This is a fact that if M is a real number, M squared is greater or equal to, who can complete this answer? If M is a real number, M squared is greater or equal to, do, 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 do. Yes, this is a fact that everybody knows. So the reason why I've done this is because now twice x squared plus y squared is greater or equal to zero. So we see that k plus four must be greater or equal to zero or k is greater or equal to minus four. Can I get a smiley face that you guys see this? So what I'm saying is, for example, if you do the graph of f and you intersect it with a plane z is equal to minus 10, this will be the empty set. So it's 
like if you slice the bread, but there's no points. So you're going to end up getting the empty set. All right. Very sneaky, ladies and gentlemen. Very sneaky. So the reason why I've rearranged my equation like this is I get k plus 4 is equal to 2x squared plus y squared, which we know from high school, the right hand side is greater or equal to zero. So that means that k plus four has got to be greater or equal to zero, or k is greater or equal to minus four. All right. So yes, you're quite right. We're looking now at cases. All right. And now let's now for fun look at the case. If k is bigger than minus four, then k plus four is equal to twice x squared plus y squared is, you guys already mentioned this, what is this? So, for example, if k is 1 or 5 or 10 or a million, what is this famous shape? What is this famous shape? Anybody? Yes. This is an ellipse. This is an ellipse. This is the famous shape. It's an ellipse. All right. And so, it just quickly draw it. So, it's not hard to see that if you make x0, um, it cuts the y axis at root k plus 4 minus root k plus 4. So typically we only care where it cuts in the axis. And when we make um, x0, this will be the root of a half k plus 2. I'm going to leave it for you to verify this. Please verify my calculations at home. So this is what it looks like if k is greater than minus four. All right. So what does this mean? What do you guys think happens if we make K bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? Anybody? So you're going to verify that if K is bigger than minus four, the shape is an ellipse. Just double check you agree. All right. Well, the best way is to investigate, ladies and gentlemen. So please, I say this, and I am going to say this more. You've got to learn to investigate. All right. So let's quickly investigate two examples. All right. So I'm going to quickly. So this is why I hope you have pen and paper with you. So x axis, y axis. So where does it cut the y axis when k is zero? Where does it cut the y-axis? Can anybody tell me? Where does it cut the y-axis? Stefan, be careful. Mr. For Mark. Yeah, you get 0 plus 4, which is 4, and the root of 4 is 2. So it cuts it at 2 and minus 2. And if k is 0, that's quite easy to check. That's root 2 and root 2. All right. Can anybody give me a k value bigger than 0? Can anybody give me a k value bigger than 0? Yeah, let's do one. Let's do one. All right. I'm going to do it in pink. I'm going to do it in pink. So if k is one, then the root of k plus four becomes the root of five. So it looks kind of like this. So the pink is when k is one. So now this point is root five. Do you see? I care where it cuts. That's minus root five. And who can tell me what is this point? What is this point? So when k is one, we get it the pink ellipse. And where does a pink ellipse cut the x-axis? Ah, that's meant to be minus root 2. And that's obviously minus. So I'm going to wait for you guys to do some maths. What? Yeah, 2.5. So that's going to be slightly bigger. So that's root 2.5. And that point, guys, you've got to indicate all of where it cuts these things. All right? And obviously, you can do another one. You can maybe do one where, I'm going to leave it for you, when k is equal to 5. You can see where it cuts. You can work out these points. All right, so homework. But the moral of the story is the following. So note, as k increases, the ellipsis gets bigger. Are there any questions? So the one at the top was an arbitrary k. But here, the blue is k equal to naught. 
the pink is k equal to one, the green will be k is equal to five. Yes, Rob. So now we're getting to the cherry on the cake. Cherry on the cake. All right. Um, no, Mr. Muller. All right. Um, we would need a we need, we would need a lot of information. So, Miss Radebe, this is why we do z equal to k. This is why we do z equal to k. All right. So, putting it all together, this is the final step in this calculation, and this is what it ends up looking. If you want to, you can call it a bowl. I would accept the word bowl in semester test one. So, I would accept the word bowl. But Clarica, here is the fancy answer. The fancy answer, it's an elliptic paraboloid. It's an elliptic paraboloid. So as you slice up higher, the ellipsis becomes bigger. So this is where the word elliptic comes from. So the first adjective is as you move from the bottom to the top, every time you slice it, the ellipsis becomes bigger. Clar Clarica, can I get a smiley face that you see? So z equal to minus 4 is the turning point, naught, naught, minus 4. But as z is bigger than minus 4, every time you get an ellipse coming up, every time the surface forms in an ellipse, all right? Now, remember, we did that other two calculations. If you cut it with the x, z or the y z plane you get parabolas coming out and that is why the convention is to call it an elliptic paraboloid the convention is to call it an elliptic paraboloid so this surface when you put all of that data together so you do x equal to naught slice y equal to naught slice z equal to naught slice the fourth one is z equal to k slice so moving from the bottom to the top and if you put all of those cat scans together you get this beautiful shape called the elliptic paraboloid. Elliptic paraboloid. Let me repeat that. So in my diagram over here, so the yellow is a parabola, and that's when we do the yz plane. The red is a parabola when we do the xz plane. And now when you do k equal to minus 4, z equal to k equal to minus 4, you get this point k equal to minus 2, you get this ellipse. k equal to naught, you get this ellipse. Remember, we discovered this ellipse. It cuts it at minus 2, 2, root 2, minus root 2. k equal to 2 is this ellipse. It gets bigger. k equal to 4 is this ellipse. So you can see, d is very important. The ellipses, the higher up you go, the bigger the ellipses become. So you end up getting this stunning shape, which is called an elliptic paraboloid elliptic paraboloid all right so as i said time really flies when you're having fun so look at all of the examples in the book especially example 17 all right and also do the problems in chapter 1.1 and 1.2 that is my lesson for now 